Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And I've got a really interesting guest for you today. He's a he's dedicated, his name is David Chotka, and he's dedicated to teaching everyone about hearing the voice. And you know, he's today's conversation is going to be about faith, spirituality, religion. Uh, not not particularly advocating. We're just discussing these principles, and it's gonna be a really interesting conversation. And I'm happy to welcome him to the show. David, welcome. Thank you, Doctor. Good, to, good to meet you uh, across the miles. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, you're. Tra- I know you're traveling, and where are you uh, traveling from? Well, I'm I'm from Windsor, Ontario, Canada, and right now I'm in Jackson, Mississippi. I'm recording videos around this book, actually, the one that uh, the, this book called Healing Prayer: God's Idea for Restoring Spirit, Mind, and Body, Mind, and Spirit. And uh, this book was just released by a publishing house called Whitaker House. Yeah. And it includes accounts of people who were healed by faith, some who weren't, people in the middle, med- medicine and mystery intertwining and so on. It's a book that encompasses all of, of this trajectory called Healing Prayer. Yeah, <laughs> that's very interesting. And um, what is it? Um, what is So you have so many interesting um, threads that we can talk about. And one thing you said is you're convinced that uh, the universe has been speaking with you. You just didn't have a clue. So what is- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well said, well said. Yes. So you, you trip into divine guidance until you realize that divine guidance can be granted. That's a good way to say that. So um, I don't know. How do you want me to begin to explain that? Should, should I start the process by, uh, by just describing how, how I heard the voice? L- let me tell you a time when I did. I'll, I'll tell you a time when I did. So uh, back in the day when I first got started with, uh, with the gospel and I'm a Christian believer, Uh, I had not a clue how to pray or how to bump around from pillar to post. And people were trying to tell me that now my life was changed, but now I had to figure out how to change my life, that kind of thing. And nobody would tell me how to pray or how to go about this. And there was a moment where where, uh, I wound up discovering a principle. And the principle was that you should practice generosity. And there's a long story attached to how I learned this thing. But suffice it to say that in those days, I was living in what the United States calls the Rust Belt, okay? So, you know, all this, I was in Southern Ontario and the town that I was in was a General Motors town and my parents ran a restaurant. Now there was a moment when the gas guzzler cars were being replaced by Japanese imports and uh, they were going 12 miles to the, to the gallon and the Japanese imports were going 35, 40 miles to the gallon. So people were no longer buying those cars and GM and Ford and, uh, and, the, and Chrysler were way behind in research and development. And so there was a huge time there where the where the unemployment rate in my town, which was the GM town, was twenty two and a half percent. Oh, man, it was bad. And uh, I had to get a I needed a job and I'd landed a job with a railway company. And as it turned out, I got the job in January so that I could start my job in May because I had this break from school. Right. And all, all the students did that. Here's what happened. They stopped shipping cars. CN Rail was a big company and it gave great product and it was shipping things all across the country. And when the day was done, um, they called me a week before my job was to finish. And then they said, oh, by the way, we have to lay off our regulars. We can't put summer students on. It's not going to happen. So I was without a job in a time of terrible unemployment and I had no opportunity and I had to make money. So I'd go back to school. So I remember saying, oh, God, what a mess. <laughs> Would you please help me? <laughs> now, this is the very first time I ever recognized that the voice was speaking to me. So there was a customer in my parents' restaurant, and he always came in at 9.45 in the morning for coffee, and he always came in at 1.15 in the afternoon for my mother's homemade soup. He would do that every day, and it was like sort of like a family diner. So this guy, I'm depressed. I'm telling everybody about the terrible experience I just had with CN Rail. Isn't it awful? I lost my job. It was a high paying job. It wasn't going to happen. And I had to go to school in the fall. So this guy behind the counter had watched me for years. I mean, we're talking about years. This is one of those neighborhood diners where everybody sort of showed up all the time and you got to know them by first name. In fact, I could tell people what their order was before I could remember their name. Oh, here comes the two eggs, two, two eggs over easy on brown toast guy, right? <laughs> Anyway, this fellow always came in. His name was Stan. And he said, David, I hear you lost your job with CN Rail. I said, well, I never got it, Stan. The unemployment's so terrible. I couldn't get the job. He said, well, look, I need a driver for my company. Um, would you consider coming to work for me? I don't need a, any kind of references. I've watched you work from the time you were a little boy. I know I like your work ethic. I said, you know, some, Stan, no job, some job is better than no job. The trouble was it paid minimum wage. 
and there were no benefits. And he was very clear about that. And it was going to be a subsistence wage, but I was living at home and I could manage that. So I said, okay. And my dad gave me the keys to his car. Now here's the moment when the voice spoke. I started driving toward that address at the appointed time and one of the downtimes in the restaurant. And as I was driving to it, suddenly my interior being began to just feel terrible. Like it was this internal sense of strife. And I wondered if it was nerves because I'd never worked for this guy before, but it was honest work. It was delivering pantyhose and greeting cards. Now I want to be clear. I went door. I didn't go door to door. I went store to store. (laughs) Anyway, this guy said he offered me this job and I drove up to the address and there was a red brick building covered with vines. It had a loading dock. It had an inset door inside the loading dock. And I walked over to it. I knocked on the inset door. Nobody answered. Now, I had absolutely no peace in my soul. My soul had turned to lead. And so I shouted. I walked. I looked around the building. I couldn't see any entrance at all. I wondered if I had the wrong address. Got back in my daddy's car, and I tried to drive back to our diner. And as I was driving, my peace restored and my joy restored. It was the craziest thing. So I get back to the restaurant. My dad says, when do you start? I said, dad, I couldn't find the front door. And he was not impressed with the intelligence level of his son. Anyway, what happened after this was the customer came in for his afternoon soup and he said, hey, you, you didn't show up at the office. I said, well, Stan, it's the craziest thing. Is this the right address? I thought I went to the right address. It was a red brick building covered in vines, had a loading dock and had an inset door. He said, oh, then he started to laugh. He said, oh, yeah, all of our business is by phone or by our salesman selling product. You have to go around the back of the building. There's a trellis there. It's overgrown with vine. Go around the trellis and inside you'll find the door. And so my dad no longer thought I was an idiot. He gave me the keys to the car and I started to drive. And as I drove, my spirit got heavier and heavier. It turned to almost like a feeling of like lead. And as I walked around, around this trellis, I saw the secretary. She said, oh, Mr. Chodka, Mr. Mr. Shepherd has said you have the job. He knows you just have to sign on for 90 days. When you sign on for 90 days, he has to train you. It's a minimum wage job. Are you prepared to be bonded for 90 days? And I had the pen in my hand and it was 22 and a half percent unemployment in the Rust Belt. I forced myself to sign it and I felt physically ill. I got back in the car. I drove back home. I told my dad I'd start the next day when Stan would show up with his moving with his van at, at coffee time and he'd start to train me. The next morning at eight o'clock in the morning, the phone rang. It was the Department of Highways offering me a full-time job for students with a return program for the next four consecutive years, twice the minimum wage, medical and dental benefits built in, but I'd given my word to a family friend. And so I was being warned not to take the job. And that was the first time I recognized that I heard the voice. Now, let me tell you the positive side. Okay, so here's the positive side. I become a believer. I don't know the Bible very well. Somebody t- tells me that I have to practice generosity. So I start giving 10% of my wage and I put it in an envelope, but it's a minimum wage job. I don't have any money. <laughs> so eventually about 120 bucks is in this envelope. Now I had friends who wanted to go overseas to serve the Lord in a different context. And they were broke students like I was a broke student. And we had talked about the fact that we had no money many a time, right? So this was not a surprise to me. So I get to this moment where I have about $120 in this tithe fund. And I decide that I want to figure out whether or not I should give some of that money. And so I knelt beside my bed and I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do with this money? Do you want me to give it to someone? And suddenly my whole being exploded in peace and it got bigger and bigger. I said, well, who should I give it to? And I immediately thought of this couple, Derek and Deb. And uh, I said, how much should I give him, Lord? And I didn't want to give it all. So I started with $110. I said, should I give him 110 bucks? And I got a sense in my spirit that it wasn't quite right. It was a little jilted, but there was this invitation to try again. Now, I was a cheapskate, so I went lower instead of higher. (laughs) So I went down to 109. And as I did, my spirit got lighter. And then then I said, Lord, how about $108? And as soon as I said that, I sense joy flowing into my spirit. I leaped to my feet and I said, yes, yes, yes. I must give Derek and Deb $108. They need it now. Now it was Friday at four o'clock in the afternoon. Now I had to go and clean the, the, the diner next door. And so I cleaned the diner. I got my chores done. I got the grease off the pans and I took $108, $108, I shoved it in an envelope and I put a scripture verse about God supplying all our needs according to his riches and glory. I drove over to my friend's house and I waited till sunset. It was dark. 
And then I snuck up to the door. The porch light was burned out and I put the envelope inside their mailbox and I ran away. And then two weeks later, I got very curious. Wanted to know what happened with $108. So I'm, I, I decide that I'm, and I only live two blocks away and I used, to, I used to jog and I used to walk. So I was going for walks up and down the street until finally Derek stuck his head out the door and said, hey, Dave, how you doing? I said, fine, Derek, how are you? He said, oh, I've got an amazing thing to tell you. And then he quoted the scripture I put in the envelope. Our God is going to supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. And I was feeling really smug, you know, smug. And so I said, well, tell me the story. He invites me inside. He sits me down. Now, remember, I told you, four o'clock Friday in the afternoon. This man says, two weeks ago on Friday at four o'clock in the afternoon, my wife and I were talking to each other about our need for us to go overseas. I had not yet finished my degree and I needed two courses and one was offered only every two years, and it was going to be offered the following Monday night. Now, it was Friday. The trouble was, our parents were away. This is before cell phones. Our parents were away. We couldn't get in touch with them. We needed to pay for the course on Monday, and we weren't going to get paid till Wednesday. We had food in the fridge. We had gas in the car. We only had $50, and we needed $158. So on Friday at four o'clock in the afternoon, we knelt down in our living room. We said, oh, God, would you please tell someone to send us one hundred and eight dollars in cash? And I was praying three blocks away, asking God if I should give some money away. And it was whittled down from one hundred and ten to one hundred and nine to one hundred and eight. And I wound up giving them that money. Now, I didn't tell them at that time, but I will tell you that it was the most amazing thing because, number one, it was exact. Number two, it was at exactly the same time. And number three, it was in harmony with the teaching that we were trying to learn. And from that point forward, I knew this. Oh, by the way, I got it right. <laughs> the, the part that was so powerful for me was that I hadn't just you know, uh, decided to give some money away, which is a very common thing. It was that I decided to pray about where the money should go. I was given an exact dollar figure in real time when those two others were praying about the very same matter. And then I realized that the teaching in that scripture was true. My God shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It was just the most amazing thing. The goosebumps went up and down my spine. Now, you see, the first time I didn't recognize how to pay attention to the signals. And the second time, having learned only a few weeks before that you should pay attention to that increase of peace or the withdrawing of it, I paid attention and I nailed it. Now, that story, those two stories are both found in this book. This is the one that I, that's on Amazon. It's, hey, are you there? It's me, God. How to listen, test, and know when God speaks. Those two stories summarized what an idiot I was and how I learned. <laughs> I had not a clue about how to listen to the voice. Nobody was teaching me this. And in the course of time, I recognized that when God wants to speak to you, most of his communication is non-verbal. He manifests his presence by the increase or the withdrawing of his presence as you are pondering the ideas that God wants you to enter into. And so uh, the, I have a scripture verse that summarizes this. It's from Romans chapter 14. My God, uh, sorry, it says, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so it means that God sends those three things. Now, righteousness is a sweet walk with God. And by the way, if you're deciding something and you're distracted from him, this is not a good idea. That's a signal. By the way, if you're deciding something and you're drawn toward him, that's a signal. So also this, this peace, peace is internal serenity despite external circumstance. And joy is internal celebration despite external uh, trouble. And so when all three of those grow large inside of you, that's the voice. That's him talking. He's telling you to take that step. Now, I don't know, if ever, when I do seminars, I ask people whether or not they, when they walked into a room, they knew they were in the wrong place. <laughs> they, all the ads go, oh, yes, I can tell you when. And then they'll say, you mean when I, when I sense that complete and total discomfort, when I lost all peace, when I walked into that room, that was God trying to get my attention. I said, yes. Then I flipped the question. Hands up if anybody here 
walked into the room and you knew exactly, it was exactly the right place to be at the right time and good things happen. How many here have had that happen to them? Same hands go up and they'll say, say to me, do you mean that was God when that was happened to me? I say, yeah, that, that's how he speaks. He speaks by the increase or the withdrawing of his presence. And when you pay attention to that, you know you're being guided. When you ignore that, you ignore that at your peril. So that's the summary of the Hey God book I wrote. But this also applies in healing prayer. Now, it says you're a doctor. So what, what is your doctorate in, Christopher? Um, so I'm a physician by ortho. But, um, you know, these things, the, uh, these two beautiful stories that you're talking about, and the one, like I can trace back, you know, in my life, there's three times when I can get this overwhelming sense, like, you know, there's like these minute or there's these occasional hunches and intuitions, you know, throughout, but then I can, I can count three times when, you know, like this overwhelming peace and this, this warmth or this calm and yep. it kind of guide you into these major life directions. But one thing That's I had, talking. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> like three, three times, but then yeah. a lot of times he's silent. Yeah. Like there's no, like you ask him or you ask whatever and there's nothing. Is yes. This, what is that? <laughs> well, when you are in the middle of that, um, you go on what you have previously been, re has been revealed to you. So if you were in a life tra trajectory and let's say you decided you're going to study to become a doctor and you've done that, you want to become an orthopedic surgeon. So you've done that and you receive this profound sense of peace while you've done that. Then you use your noggin when you're in the middle of that. All right. When the Lord wants to interrupt your day and get your attention, that's when he breaks in to do that. And there are seasons where we just go in the strength of what's already been given to us. So what you have to do is you have to train yourself to pay attention to it. So this actually applies with healing prayer too. So you're a medical doctor. So I'll tell one medical story that talks about this. So back in the days when I was in seminary, there were two different sets of people who were inside the seminary. There were those who were what I call supernaturalists who believed in miraculous intervention. And there were those who said, no, 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 we, we don't, we don't believe in that. And there'd be these arguments back and forth about whether or not this was so for this kind this present day. And if you listen to Christian conversation, even now, you'll hear the same conversation. Was that for the age of the apostles or is this for now? Was your healing real or was that just placebo effect, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this story goes back to one of those times I was in my seminary class and here's what happened. One of the profs said something about Jesus not doing a miraculous act of power. And I said, wait a minute. I believe that, that, that the Bible is accurate and that it did in fact happen. And there was a guy in the class. He could have been a stand-up comic. He was hilarious. Anyway, he stood up and he he's one of these guys, like, like, like the old Jack Benny stuff in the back in the day. Jack could look at you and the room would laugh. This guy could look at you and the room would laugh. And if he said something, it was even more hilarious. So he cracks this joke. The whole room explodes in laughter. But I'm the object of the laughter. He made fun of my faith. Okay, so... Two days later, I'm in another class with him, and somebody says something about the Bible not being, but not being true. And I say, wait a minute, it is. And he stands up, he cracks the joke, the whole room explodes in laughter, but I'm the object of the laughter. Well, listen, that'll go on for about seven or eight or nine times. And then you say, well, he's not going to be my friend. <laughs> so there was one day I was walking across a plaza, and one, one, his mutual friend, a friend of his and mine, I got caller Susie in the book, stops me. And I said, oh, Susie, how you doing? She said, fine. Hey, you know, the comedy guy. I said, yeah. You see that hospital six blocks down the road? I said, yeah. She said, he's in there. I said, oh, what happened to him? And she said, he has phlebitis. Now, for you, those who don't know, that's a clot in your arm. And if the clot breaks free and it circulates through your bloodstream, and if it lands in your lung or your brain, 95 times out of 100, it's fatal. It's really serious. And you have to be very careful. And back in the day, back in the 80s, this is when they had not yet perfected some of the treatments we have now. Even now it's serious. But regardless of this, he was in there and it was phlebitis and he could die. And so she said, he's asked me to ask you something. I said, oh, what's that? She said, he wants you to pray for him. I said, what? Every time I've mentioned anything about this being true, he's attacked my faith. You've seen it. He's made a mockery of me. And she said, He's been cruel. I said, he has. I'll talk to him, she says. So the way she goes, I go to my class, and the next day I see the same girl in the coffee lounge. And she says to me, oh, did you go? I went to see our friend. I said, okay. And she said, well, he's really sorry, and he wants you to come and pray for him. I said, I don't believe him. <laughs> now, there were several reasons for my saying this. One, I'd never seen it. 
And two, I'd never met anybody healed by this thing called prayer faith. And three, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just a total rookie green guy. And you're in medicine, so you know this often placebo effect is, is substituted for true healing. Anyway, I didn't know about this and I wasn't going because I was scared for lots of reasons. Third day, the same girl sees me. I'm walking across the plaza and she said, oh, did you go and see our friend? I said, no, I'm not going. And she got really mad, hopping mad. It was like being told off by your mother. The fire comes out of her eyes. She stomps her foot and she screams my middle name. And she puts all my name in there with my middle, David R. Chotka. Aren't you going around this school telling everybody the Bible is the word of God is supposed to be obeyed? I said, yes. She said, well, what about this scripture? I was sick and you visited me. Uh, oh, no, now I'm going to have to go and see the guy who's so nasty and mean. <laughs> so anyway, out of sheer obedience to the scripture, I walk the six blocks of the hospital and I walk in and he's wired for sound. You know, I mean, the monitors are on him and he's got an intravenous thing going into him and nurses are walking in and out with paper pads and small vials of medication. And he's really scared. You can see he's pale as a ghost. And I go in there and Christopher, I talked about the weather. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. So I go in to visit him and talk about the weather. He said, yeah, the weather's fine. I said, well, how's your courses doing? And he told me these courses were fine. I said, well, I visited you now. I've obeyed the scripture. And he stopped me and he said, wait, wait, aren't you going to pray for me? So I said, look, every single time I have done anything to say the scripture is true, you have made me a laughing stock to our peers. Why in the name of all that is holy, are you asking me to pray for you? And he burst into tears and he said, I am so sorry I did that to you. I have phlebitis. The clot is severe. I was told yesterday that it's large. It could dislodge. This is dangerous. I could die. I'm 27. I don't want to die. Won't you please pray for your God to heal me? What are you going to do? Now, I still had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> so, so I said, uh, I remember in the Bible, Jesus put his hand on people. So I said, may I place my hand on you? He said, you may. So I said, where is it? He said, left arm above the elbow. So I went around his side. I put my hand there. I put my hand on his head. And Christopher, I prayed a prayer, but it was the most pathetic. I, I can't remember what I said, but it was something like, oh God, this guy's sick, heal him. Something like that. And as soon as I did, the atmosphere in the room changed. It was like it was filled with love and compassion and energy and power and focus. That fire went inside of me. I looked at him and I knew that God loved him and that the Lord's intention for him was to become well. I call that a gift of supernatural faith. And as I was looking at him, I knew that I had no choice except to pray that the Lord would make him well. And I continued my prayer and that fire came up inside of me. It flowed down my arm. It went into his and then he said, what is that fiery presence coming inside of you? I said, that's Jesus' spirit. He's healing you. And I ran out of the room because I'd never felt anything like that before. The next day, he's in school. And I said, you're here. And he shoves me into a corner and he says, the prayer changed my life. I said, thank you. And I ran away again because I was afraid of the guy. But in the course of time, he told me. After I left, the nurse walked in. And he said, I can go home now. Jesus has healed me. My friend from the Bible school, he came and he prayed for me. And she said, we don't do things like that around here. We got to run some tests. And so they ran them. All the phlebitis, he'd been serious the day before. All the phlebitis had vanished from his body. All of it, totally gone. And he went home that night and he thanked God that the Lord had healed him. That began the journey for me of attempting to understand how to do prayer for healing what does the scripture say? What does the gospel say? What does, how does this interface with ordinary medicine? Do medicine and miracle intertwine? Are they separated out? Here's my conclusion. People who are medical people have dedicated their lives to searching for cures and providing treatment. It's cause and effect. And you are looking at the ordinary effects of life. You have a hypothesis, you test it. And then you discover that this particular medication cures this particular kind of disease. And on the other side, you have miraculous intervention. Sometimes God guides you to a remedy. Sometimes God provides an instant cure. Sometimes they overlap. Sometimes they're separated. Is that a helpful story to you? Very helpful. And, um, you know, I would love to, because the, you know, <laughs> excuse me, 
uh, I love these stories and just um, I'm going to check out your book. How can people contact you and follow you and just read about these amazing things? And, you know, the universe sometimes really does amazing things. You know, we don't realize it, but uh, and I love just hearing about these stories of just miracles and, you know, universe speaking to you through you, you know, helping others. And how can people find you? So if you take my name, David Chotka, that's C-H-O-T-K-A, David Chotka at spiritequip.com. That's my email. But my, my website is actually spirit equip. So it's, we treat, we equip spiritual disciplines. So it's the word spirit, like Holy spirit, S P I R I T equip, like, like equipment, E Q U I P spirit equip.com. And there's links to my social media. There's links to my page. There's links to my blog spots. There's links to my YouTube channel. There's links to my Instagram account, etc. But this book, this one's anywhere books are sold. So if you go to Walmart and order healing prayer, You'll be able to get this. It's a co-write with Dr. Maxie Dunham. And this book's available at Walmart, it's at Books a Million, at uh, Barnes & Noble. Or you can get an audio book. It's available on Amazon on audiobook and Kindle. It's also, right now, as, as I'm speaking, uh, there's a group called Servant School. They're, they're doing videos that are going to be attached to this book. And within two months, you'll be able to order that and be able to get some direct teaching from me on how this works. The other ones are available on Amazon, but my website's the way to go. And there you can contact me. I go to events and I do events in churches and in regions and conferences and so on. People want to book me, they can find me there. www.spiritequip.com. And for all the audience out there listening, David, for coming on. And like I said, I love, I could spend hours with um, reverends, priests, healers, spirituality. I just, I'm very fascinated with this field because it explains, or I don't know if it explains, but it explains things that just cannot be rationally explained just through the normal human experience. So I love that. Follow David um, on his socials, give him a like and follow. Check out his books as well. I'm going to check that out as well on Amazon. And with that, thanks so much for coming on. Dr. Christopher, what a joy. And thank you for having me. May the Lord bless you. Thank you.